Brothers! What we do in life? Echoes in eternity. eternity. I mean, this is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are. This is where we hold them. This is where we fight. Officer, you need to repent of your lawless conduct. You don't know the law, and yet you pretend to represent it. That's not law enforcement, sir. That's being a thug. We will not stop fighting and bothering you all until this monstrous, barbaric practice of legalized abortion ends and we are teaching our children to do the same. God's word says that the shed blood of innocent humans cries out for justice and mark my words, they will have their day in court. Nobody gets saved by being treated nicely. They get saved by hearing the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, if we don't open our mouths and commend Christ, we're not loving Him, no matter what we're doing with our hands. Hey everybody, what's going on? It is time for Provoked, yes. and I am here with my beautiful sister, well, Desi. Thank you, sir. How are you doing today? I'm so excited and yeah. very happy. Yeah, we're super excited. So we're going to have kind of a shorter introduction to our show because we have a very, very special guest, somebody that uh, my sister and I and many others have looked up to and learned from for a long time. I think I've started learning from uh, this guy 20 years ago. Wow. Um, so we're happy. Uh, we are provoked, though, and what we'd ask you to do is go to apologiastudios.com and uh, you can sign up to become an all access member. And in so doing, you'll support our show. And as you pour out your support, we'll continue to do what we do. And all we want to do is get the gospel to as many people as we can, rescue people out of cults, save babies from death at abortion mills. That's our that's our focus. So please go there, become that all access member and help us out. So who have we brought today on the show? Ray Comfort. Right on. From Living Waters. Yeah. This guy, um, I cannot tell you how instrumental he has been in really um, helping me understand what, what true biblical evangelism is. I mean, it was the early 2000s when I had first heard a sermon called Hell's Best Kept Secret, and then other sermons and other productions that they have put out, of course, went through the way of the master. Mm -hmm. I took the well, my church through the way of the master series in 2005 or six, I can't remember. And um, it was just just revolutionized my whole understanding of what evangelism is. Mm -hmm. So, Ray, it is really great to have you, and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a joy to be here. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to get into it. We know that uh, you are, your time is precious, but we wanted to start quickly and just get to know Ray Comfort a little bit more deeply than maybe other people though. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so we just wanted to give you some quick burst questions, ask you things, right. and uh, you can answer as quickly as you can. What is your favorite food? Uh, chocolate sauce pudding with a bit of ice cream on, like in a <laughs> swimming pool that I can swim across with my mouth open. <laughs> Okay, that's, well, a good that's a really that's probably the most unique answer we've ever got. Okay, what's your favorite movie? Well, oh, obviously Ben Hur. I've watched it about eleven times, and I go goosebumps every time I see the guy that portrayed Jesus because they didn't show his face, and it, it just leaves it up to your imagination. And I absolutely love it when he uh, was given a drink, and when he gave the guy a drink, it was just just Ben Hur a drink. It was wonderful. Love yeah. It. That's Love great. I haven't oh. seen that one in a long time. Yeah, that's yeah. that's amazing. What's your favorite animal? Oh, uh, my dog is my favorite animal. Um, I do like lambs with mint sauce and gravy, but I <laughs> like dog. What's your dog's name? My son meant to ask you Sam. that. Sam. Oh, that's Sam. a cute name. Awesome. <laughs> I got a picture of him. No, nope, I haven't. Yes, I have. There he is here. He's Oh, yeah, he's the one that rides with you. He's so cute. <laughs> yeah. you get it? He's a quite, quite a conversation starter, huh? Oh, he really is. And I get a big lot of mileage when ladies call out as they go past how cute, and I call out, so is the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Who, what is your favorite book outside of the Bible? Oh, Lectures to My Students. 
uh, Charles, Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon. Yes. My wife lost a lot of sleep because of that book. She was asleep, and I'd hit her on the side and say, listen to this. And I'd give her another quote. She'd go back to sleep, and I'd hit her again and say, listen to this. Just, yeah, Spurgeon was amazing. If he had talked in his sleep, someone should have been there writing it down. He's so quotable. I right? know. Just the yeah. things that he produced, even at the age of 18, like 18 through 20, were just amazing. Yeah. God just gave him an incredible mind. Can I hop in real quick? Sure. What's your favorite Spurgeon quote? Do you have one? Oh, yes. Um, uh, have you no wish to other, for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's like a slap around the face of the contemporary church. Yes. Well, absolutely. Yes, My favorite and one. I was is... thrilled to find that quote because if people got upset, they get angry at Spurgeon and not me. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite Spurgeon quote is the sovereignty of God is the pillow I lay my head on every night. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's wow. great. Or it's something I probably yeah. paraphrased, but yeah. Okay. Favorite preacher. Um, Charles Spurgeon. I really enjoyed listening to him. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to have, someone said his voice was like silver. I would have loved to have heard what he, what he, what he preached like, but uh, yeah. Love John Wesley also. Um, they're all, no real contemporaries compared to the the greats like Spurgeon. You know, I open a Spurgeon sermon and just put my finger down, and it's immediately wow. And he would open a preach, and you know, when you when you've got a guy like that so eloquent, twenty three thousand words in his vocabulary, and you and I have got about thirteen thousand. So brilliant, so eloquent, you know, in a sanctified way. And he condescended to give out gospel tracts. He condescended to preach in the open air, and that thrills my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Favorite hobby? Uh, chasing my wife around the house. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been married? 50 something years. I can't remember. 51, 52. Same wife. Oh. She's uh, made for comfort. Four foot 11 looks up to me. <laughs> 51 years? 51. Yeah, maybe 52. Uh, together it's 102 years. <laughs> oh, praise God. That's awesome. 50, 50 plus years. That's Praise God for that, huh? Right on. Yeah. Okay. Um, last one. Favorite way to just to relax? Um, watching a movie or watching rugby, which is like American football, but you don't stop all the time. But what I do is I edit when I watch rugby and I've got a, I've got a, a plug in my ear so I can hear what's going on and I can hear what's going on on the TV. And if the commentator raises his voice with excitement, that's when I look up. But when he's not, I keep on editing. So my time is, uh, it's kind of double dual tasking, uh, getting pleasure and yet doing something that I, that I love and is most necessary for our YouTube channel. Right on. That's awesome. Okay. So before we, we kind of wanted to grill you on evangelism and I think everybody wants to hear that as well, um, because you've been a general in the army for quite some time and you remain that way, uh, with so many people gleaning from you. I think your, uh, YouTube, um, the channel's got over a million now, 1.1 million subscribers, which is just incredible. Yeah, that's very encouraging and two, over 200 million views. And that really thrills our heart. I'll tell you why. You go back 50 years to church or mass church crusades uh, that take a couple of years to pull all these churches together, like kind of herding cats. Get them together, cost millions of dollars to do that, have to promote it, promote it. And most of the people there were churchgoers anyway. And, uh, and yet, with a push of a button, we can reach millions because of YouTube. And uh, we're so thankful to God for that. Yeah, it's awesome. And what is so encouraging to me is you guys don't pull any punches. I mean, I think everything that you speak the truth in love, and you are so gracious in the way that you share the gospel, I mean, just unfailingly. And I think that is such a major component of effective evangelism. But you don't, you don't white, you know, uh, water down the truth at all. You're not giving a... Um, you know, compromised or capitulated type of gospel presentation. So it's awesome to see so many subscribers when you tell it like it is. And mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that so much. So uh, before we kind of ask you some questions about well, People are tuning in to see if I get beaten up. Or not. <laughs> yeah, that's one of actually one of our questions and down the road a little bit. But can you just share with us your testimony, maybe, maybe briefly, like how the Lord saved you and why you do what you do? Yeah, I was born twice in New Zealand. Uh, the second time was April the 25th, 1972, April the 24th, not sure, 1.30 in the morning. And the reason I, I got saved is because six months earlier, I wept. And I wept because I was so happy, and yet I could see death coming. And I thought, this is crazy. I could lose my wife through, through, de through death at any moment, and all my material things will mean nothing. And I, I just cried out, why? I couldn't understand why death was waiting for all of us. 
like 10 out of 10 die and no one talked about it and everyone's scared of it. And I didn't even think I was crying out to God, but the Lord heard my prayer. And six months later, I was on a surfing trip. Five of us on a surfing trip. One was a Christian. He left a Bible open on a table. I read the words of Jesus. You've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. I remember thinking, wow, that's okay. I have never committed adultery. I'll make it to heaven if there is one. And then I read what followed. But whosoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already within his heart. And I screamed, oh, no. Does God see my thought life? Is he putting his finger on that pleasurable sin that every man has? I mean, I used to go surfing and dangle my feet as shark bait in freezing water to try and get pleasure. But with lust, it's instant pleasure for any guy, any time. Just look at a woman and just get pleasure out of a sexual thought. And God was saying it was wrong and my heart sunk. And then when I understood the cross, my heart broke when I saw the cost of my redemption. And I was, I was saved that night, found everlasting life, and was like a crazy man with joy telling other people about Christ. Um, if, if a doctor found a cure to cancer, he'd run through cancer wards yelling, I've found it, I've found it, take this, please. Well, I was like that, and that was 50-something years ago. Nowadays, I'm much worse. You know, I'm just, I'm just a crazy man wanting to share the gospel with anybody who will listen. Anyway, I, uh, my testimony goes on. I, I discovered Hell's Best Kept Secret uh, in September of uh, 1982, and I was very frustrated as a Christian, seeing people fall away from the faith at a mass rate. And I discovered that biblical principle. And thanks to Charles Spurgeon, I read a portion of a sermon by him. And so I began teaching it, thinking I was going to be uh, set aside as a legalist. And the exact opposite happened. Started getting invitations to Hawaii and been invited to base our ministry in Southern California. Uh, began teaching that, uh, that teaching. And it was very limited for the first three years. No one knew who I was in New Zealand. I had an established ministry, but in the US, they didn't know if I was a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon or what, who are you? But then David Wilkerson called from New York and then Bill Gothard called and he'd seen the video and both of them had. Bill Gothard put it on, he filmed me on video and screened it to 30,000 pastors and that just split open the ministry, just exploded. And then Kirk Cameron called in 2001, he had heard Hell's Best Kept Secret. And that put the whole ministry on steroids and we haven't looked back since. So I look, I look at what's happened in my life and I think it's just such an incredible journey that God's allowed me to be part of. Someone once asked me, how is it that you get an internationally known ministry? I said, it's really simple. All you do is get an incredibly popular Hollywood celebrity to call you and say you want to combine ministries. That's all you have to do. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, but um, you were preaching in New Zealand open air for quite some time before that, right? I mean, uh, yes. at, at Speaker's Corner. I can't remember exactly what that was called. But how long were it you was, doing that? You got it right. Yeah. How many years were you doing that? 12 years almost every day with the weather permitted. Wow. So you were working, and then while you were working, you were still going down and open air preaching daily for 12 years prior to all this. Yeah. Like, yeah, see this jacket? I used to make jackets exactly like this for about 10 years. People would come into my shop and I'd measure them up and I'd make them a jacket just like this. So I was my own boss. So I could choose to do what I wanted when I wanted. And I would go into the local square each day uh, into Speaker's Corner and preach the gospel and then come back. So it was a, it was a, a great liberty I had in my business. Yeah, that's, wow. that's amazing. Just so much faithfulness even prior to everything God had done on kind of a global uh, sphere now, which yeah. is amazing. So are, do you still have that? And I don't even know if this is true. I was going to ask you, but um, I heard that if somebody can find you without a tract on you, um, then they get something right. And then somebody had caught you in the pool thinking that yeah, you didn't a thousand dollars. If someone finds me in public without tracks, they'll give them a thousand dollars cash. And someone saw me in a swimming pool and went, aha. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. it'll never happen i've actually got john 3 16 and a sinner's prayer tattooed on my chest <laughs> that's smart i don't want to be out a thousand bucks too so that's pretty smart <laughs> that is awesome okay so we wanted to of course just um dig in as far as uh, evangelism uh questions and just kind of you know pick around in your brain a little bit on uh 
because that's what people want to hear. They want to learn from you and as they as they continue to watch you. But I guess in a nutshell, for pre- people that are just tuning in, and we do get a lot of people that are new to the faith, they come here and they don't know how to evangelize whatsoever um, because the purpose of our podcast is to help them. Just come alongside. We're a bunch of ordinary people, and we really want to provoke and spurn the church unto good works, which, of course, a part of that is learning how to effectively share your faith. So how would you just describe biblical evangelism? What is it? It's uh, obeying the admonition to warn every man that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. God is not the God that most people imagine him to be. He's a God of justice and truth and righteousness and holiness that's so holy, better to stand on the face of the sun than stand in the presence of God in your sins. Moses said, let me see your glory, God. And God said, you can't see me and live. So he hit him in a cleft of a rock and allowed Moses to look on where he had been. And Moses' face so shone, the children of Israel couldn't look at Moses because he had looked at where God had been. And the reason he couldn't stand in the presence of God is that God would kill him in his holiness. Justice would come out like livid lightning and destroy him because of God's holiness, like a judge looks at a man that slaughtered three young ladies after he raped them, horribly killed them. The judge would be furious and bring his gavel down with his teeth gritted. Well, God has his teeth gritted on steroids of the evil of mankind. His wrath abides on all of us. And so until we come to Christ, we don't have his blessing. We have his anger and we're storing up wrath. It's going to be revealed on the day of judgment. Death is evidence that God is serious about sin. It's wages that God pays us in. And so we need to warn every man that they have to stand before God and he's seen their thought life and he's going to judge them by the standard of absolute holiness and purity. And that's a fearful thing. And uh, so we say God has provided a savior so you don't have to end up in hell. If you repent and trust in Christ, God will forgive your sins. So it's proclamation of the gospel, preceding it by the moral law to show what sin is, preaching Christ crucified, rising from the dead, and the necessity of repentance and faith. Awesome. Where where do you see um, a lot of problems, I guess, in the American evangelical church as far as like evangelism or evangelistic methodologies being represented? Where do you see kind of the church falling off the cliff? Yeah, it has fallen off the cliff. Um, Most pastors don't lead the flock. They're they're not an example of the flock. Um, You know, it's all very well to say, go into all the world, but we should be an example and say, come, I'll come with you. And I, if I get to talk to pastors, I said, the best thing you could ever do is join a racquetball club or a soccer club, something secular, and rub shoulders with the ungodly, witness to them, and then get in your pulpit and tell your flock exactly what you did. Amen. Say, this week I met this guy, his name was George, he was an atheist, but when I talked to him about the insanity of atheism, he changed his mind and he listened to the gospel. And people are going to say, pastor condescends to do the lowly task of evangelism of evangelism, and the pastor will reproduce after his own kind. Amen. If he's into prophecy, his flock will be in a prophecy. If he's into prosperity, flock will be into prosperity. Yeah. If he's into reaching the lost, the flock will be into reaching the lost. They will want to reproduce Amen. and bring people into the church, and well, the church, not just the local church. So that's what's missing in evangelism. Pastors don't have the fear of God. They should have. And thundering the fear of the Lord from the pulpit, and letting that lightning put the fear of God in the hearts of his people will cause them to do what he says. Awesome. You know, Paul awesome. said, wherefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What, what encourages me to persuade men? The terror of the Lord. I dare not disobey God. I dare not let people go to hell. And I don't want sinners to stand before a holy God and be damned in hell. Lake of fire, that horrifies me. And so when pastors get that fear of the Lord, They'll preach the fear of God, and the fear of God is what causes men to depart from sin. That's what the scriptures say, and that would cleanse the church. So I think that's what's lacking, the fear of God within the church. that will cause the church to stand up and be like the church in the book of Acts. Amen. Why do you think pastors are kind of derelict of their duty? Why are they not doing what you just said that we need to be doing? Well, pastors are ordinary people, just like you and I, and I feel for them. I did three and a half years as a pastor, three and a half, the time of tribulation, three and a half years. I didn't enjoy it. It was very difficult. And I, my heart goes out to local pastors. It's a very difficult job to have, preaching to the same people every week. So pastors are just like me. They're weak. In that sense, they have problems with the fear of man. Everyone I look at begins by looking like 
Goliath. And I've got to say, no, this is Zacchaeus. I've got to see this person isn't to scare me off. I've got to love them and let love swallow my fears. So what I would say to people who have a problem with the fear of God is <clears throat> do this. When you know you should witness to an unsaved per person, don't talk to them about sin, righteousness, judgment, Jesus, heaven, hell, the cross. You don't need to do that to begin with. Do what I do, and this has been what's taken every Goliath and made him into a Zacchaeus. I just say, hi, how you doing? And he says, I'm good. So my name's Ray. What's your name? I'm Fred. Fred, I got a question for you. He says, what is that? So do you think there's an afterlife? Now, I didn't mention God, Jesus, heaven, hell, all those things that make him and I feel uncomfortable. I just said, do you think there's an afterlife? I asked for his opinion. And I find when people begin talking about it, it dissipates my fears. When Fred says to me, oh, I don't know, that's the big question. I said, do you think about it much? He says, all the time. And I, all the time? This guy's a human being. He's fearful of death. And that dissipates my fears. I say, you're afraid of dying? He says, yeah, I'm terrified. I said, well, let's talk about it. Do you know what causes death according to the Bible? It's wages. Let's see if you've earned your wages. Let's look at the Ten Commandments. So if you get it down, you'll, you'll find it so much more easy if you know how to begin. It's like riding a bike. If you're, if you're a parent that's taught a kid to ride a bike, it's a terrifyingly frustrating thing for a parent because the kid won't pedal. He's too busy screaming, <laughs> don't let go, don't let go. And you just say, hey, pedal. Because if you get momentum, you're going to get balance. Just get moving. Exactly the same applies with evangelism. Just get moving. Momentum will give you balance. You'll be able to do this if you just start going. So start off by giving someone a tract. Ask someone if they think there's an afterlife and just let them talk and then ask questions. And you'll find that your confidence will grow and you'll be peddling before you know it. That's awesome. Amen. That's yeah. So, great. so another question is, um, you know, how would you kind of define effective biblical evangelism? Because I remember back in the day, I would kind of present um, an evangelism ministry. It was actually after going through Way of the Master. Hey, I really want to teach the church how to evangelize. And I would go out and preach the gospel. And then the next Sunday, nobody would come to church. And so, um, you know, the leaders there said, I just don't think this is working because nobody's coming to the church. So is effective evangelism getting people located into a church or is it something else? It's not necessarily. It's really just planting seed. You know, that's all it is. The, the quality is in the seed and not in the sower. So I've never, ever led anyone to Christ. It's God that saves people. Um, I just share the gospel. I plant the seed in the heart and I'll pray for people and pray that God saves them. So when you realize that success is just being faithful, mm -hmm. then you don't have to get a decision for people. You don't have to bring people to your church. Say, look, pastor, I want six people to the, to the Lord this week. No, you didn't. You just got a decision from them. You don't even know if they're saved and they won't stay in the local church for too long if the music isn't good. So if you see yourself as like being a gardener, when you plant seed in your garden, you don't make it grow. You plant it, you water it, and it grows and bears fruit. And that's what evangelism is. And uh, I thank God, and, and I say this in all humility, I thank God that I've spent my life serving the Lord. Right from the moment I was saved, I've shared the gospel. And when I, when I lay my head on, on my deathbed, on my pillow, I've got the satisfaction of knowing that I haven't wasted my time. The Bible says, redeem the time for the day is, days are evil. So don't waste your time. Do something for the kingdom of God. There's only one thing that matters. C.T. Studd, I think it was, says, it's only what you do for Christ that will last. And it's so true. It's only what you do for the kingdom of God. I feel sorry for these billionaires. They're paupers. I feel sorry for these people that give themselves in Hollywood and became, become ex incredibly famous and just die and have no hope in their death. My heart breaks for them. They're rich in this world's goods, but paupers when it comes to that which matters. So Make sure you get your priorities straight and don't serve this world because it's futile. Amen. Yeah. So we had Eddie Roman on last week and he's a pretty amazing guy. I think you know him. <laughs> um, but he said you still go out evangelizing, evangelizing quite often, multiple times a week. Um, so the question is, how do you stay in the battle for so long with the same type of vigor? You know, what, what, what from your perspective is kind of the key to longevity in evangelism? Yeah, I cannot express to you the gratitude that I have to God that I have everlasting life. It's an explosion, explosion within my soul. Um, gratitude is the high octane fuel that drives me. You know, uh, when you when you love someone, you live for them. 
I love my wife with, a, with an absolute passion. I live to make her happy. I, I cook meals at night. I can't wait till she gets home because I've got food waiting for her. And I love to see her laugh when we're watching something on TV. It gives me great joy. So her happiness is my greatest joy. And I know what brings joy to God. There's no more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous persons. So I want to show the Lord how grateful I am. What I can't express in, in, uh, in words, I express in works. That's my motivation, gratitude to God for his mercy and granting me everlasting life. And at the same time, it's a horror for unsaved people. It drives me to reach out to them and plead with them daily. And I do, I do go out twice a day, uh, except on uh, Sundays and uh, Fridays, I only go out once a day. Uh, on my bike, and I get to speak to a lot of people. And I'll tell you what I do. My Bible says, by the will of God or by the... By, by your good works, you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. I always have on my person, you know what in and out Oh, you're from California. You know what in and out is? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> best, best hamburgers in California. Oh, I buy, Agreed. buy literally thousands of these little, little $5 cards that I give to people. And this is what I do. I go around to the local college. I ride around. I'll go up to someone and say, excuse me, would you like to go on YouTube? And they say, no. I say, over 200 million views. This is your big opportunity. You've had two years of boredom. This is something exciting. Do you want to do it? I'll give you two $5 in and out cards as a thank you if you'll come on camera. They say, no, I don't want to. I say, okay, here's the two $5 in and out cards anyway. And you should see the reaction. They just go, you can't do that. I say, yes, I can. See you later. And off. <laughs> and it gives me so much joy. It's more blessed to give than receive. And the reason I do it is because this world, you get nothing for nothing. Everything's got a string attached to it. But when a Christian goes up and does something kind for an unsaved person, it speaks volumes. And at the same time, I give them one of our little cards. I like this, but smaller with details on the back. So how can I watch a YouTube channel? And often I drive away. People will call out, I'm going to subscribe to your channel. Thanks very much. I said, there's, there's no need. Just go and enjoy that food. And uh, so that's uh, when people say no, they won't come on camera. It's just about as joyful to me as when they say, yes, I will. That's awesome. Okay. Well, our time is almost up with them. Do you have one more question? Or No, I just, you know, I, I know that you don't want us to puff you up or, you know, uh, we want to give God all the glory, but the Bible also does say to give credit where credit is due. So I just want to personally thank you for just your ministry and faithfulness, because when I was first saved, Zach, this is my blood brother. We're not just brother and sister in Christ. He's actually my brother, but he gave me he uh, took us through in his church way of the master. So that was right from the beginning. And then I on, early on was struggling with the issue of abortion. And he said, just watch this, this movie. And it was 180. And that changed my life and really gave me a heart for the preborn to fight for them. And just as a mom, um, even today, I was doing homeschool with my son, uh, Liam, and we were going through something in his science book and s stuff about evolution came on and we just popped on YouTube, watched your video on 10 reasons why evolution is false. And so, and those are just, just minuscule examples of just the tremendous blessing that your ministry has been. Uh, we, I remember listening to Hell's Best Secret early on in my walk too, and just being like, you know, eyes wide open because I was uh, a false convert and I didn't get saved until I was in my late twenties. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you, and it's just such an honor to to talk with you. And let me just say something, if I may. Of course. You know, people come up to me and say, Ray, you're doing a great job, and give me a sort of a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to tell you, for me, what I'm doing is like putting my head into a cake of frosting with my mouth open. I am so pumped at what I do to be able to talk to people about the things of God, to have a dog with sunglasses, to have a television program. All these things are just such a such a joy. And to, to serve the Lord is very, very humbling. And to think that God uses a little nobody from nowhere with nothing but a love for God just keeps me very humble. Yeah. <laughs> and and we really don't know, know the extent of living waters. Uh, reach. Just yeah. the reach. And really, we will maybe in glory, but it's it's pretty profound. I mean, even in the 180 movies, we've given out hundreds, if, if not thousands. It's something that we regularly give out at the abortion mills when we go out. We have teams that go out here in uh, Phoenix five, six times a week. And that's just part of our handing it to moms and, and uh, you know, people going in and out trying to kill their babies. So yeah, yeah. we just can't thank you enough. So uh, we're going to let you go, but we wanted you just to, in a concise way, which you do so well, if you could just share the gospel with the unbelievers watching our show. 
Yeah, about 30 seconds, half a minute, two minutes, one minute, one well, minute. Whatever you'd like. Yeah, whatever you, you whatever you have time for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, that's it. You know, um, the greatest evidence for God's existence is his creation. Creation tells us there's a creator. And when I meet an atheist, and I was talking to an atheist today, all you got to do is think of what atheism is. An atheist believes the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything. It is worse than insane. They don't say nothing was in the beginning. Like we say, God created everything from nothing. They say nothing was the creative force that brought everything into being, like flowers and birds and trees, the sun, the moon, the stars, puppies and kittens, male and female. All these things came because nothing created it. Atheism is absurd. It's intellectual suicide. And what it really is, is just an excuse to carry on in your sins. When I begin probing atheists, I find that it's not a uh, intellectual argument, argument, it's a moral argument. They're watching porn and having sex with their girlfriend and they don't want to give that up. And they're like the prodigal son who went to a far country to get away from his father. Atheism is a far country to get away from God because you want to carry out your sinful desires. But you're in terrible, terrible danger. I've been just recently asking uh, people, I've been doing it today and yesterday, I said, if you found you're going to die in two weeks, what would you do with your life? Let's say you work for a bank and you can steal a million dollars and not be found out for a month. That is, you can cook the books and you're going to be dead in two weeks. So it's two weeks after you die, they'll discover you took a million dollars from the bank. You won't be punished because you're not here. And you, you can get to Las Vegas and spend that money on prostitutes and gambling. Or you can say, I got to face God on judgment day and you begin to pray your heart out. Which way would you go, prostitutes or prayer? And I had guys today, I said, I'll go for the prostitutes. A few guys said, I go for the prayer. And I said, you liar. <laughs> because their hearts are deceitfully wicked. The Bible says we love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And we've got eyes full of adultery, the Bible says, until we come to Christ. And the reason you need to come to the Savior is because God's going to expose every secret sin you've ever committed. Nothing is hid from the eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. Every idle word a man speaks, he'll give an account for on the day of judgment. Like I said earlier, Jesus said, if you as much as looked at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. And thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you've ever used God's name in vain, you've used God's name in place of a filth word. And that's punishable by death in the Old Testament. So if God judges you by those commandments, which are written on your heart, by the way, you're going to be guilty on judgment day and you're going to end up in hell justly and that horrifies me but god's rich in mercy and he provided a savior jesus came he was god manifest in the flesh the bible says perfect sinless man who gave his life on a cross taking the punishment for the sin of the world that's why he cried it is finished we broke that law the ten commandments jesus paid the fine that means god can dismiss our case legally he can forgive your sins in an instant and grant you everlasting life all because of the death and resurrection of the Savior. And all you need do, it's so simple a child can understand it, and that's the stumbling block for many, is repent of your sins, confess and forsake them. The Bible speaks of godly sorrow, working repentance unto life. That's the way of salvation. Contrition, being sorry for your sins, repentance and faith in Jesus. Like David, when he was caught in a sin with Bathsheba, he cried out, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. When you come and say that to God, say, God, you gave me life and I've cussed your name and I've done things that are morally wrong. Please forgive me. The Bible says a, a contrite heart he won't despise. And then put your faith in Jesus like you trust a parachute. You don't just believe in a parachute, you put your faith into it. So put your faith in the Savior for your eternal salvation. And if you do that, repentance and faith, you've got a promise from the God who cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie, but he'll forgive your sins, create a clean heart in you, give you a brand new desire to do that which is right, and grant you the gift of eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So today you've got a choice. The pleasures of sin for a season, damnation and hell, where God removes every pleasure you've ever had because of your ingratitude or trust in Jesus, everlasting life. You've got hope in your death and there's nothing more precious than that. God bless you. 
Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, this was definitely our, our best episode <laughs> to date. Well, don't um, tell Eddie Roman that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> poor Eddie. My husband was on too, so he might be offended. <laughs> <laughs> thank no, you Ray. yeah we're was... so grateful um yeah like we said we've looked up to you and learned from you for so long and it's just been a just a joy to have you on so we appreciate your brother we're praying for you and keep on riding that bike and taking that dog out and sharing the truth <laughs> thanks so much for coming on okay thank you god bless you guys thank god you, bless Ray. you god bless you thank bye you. well that was amazing uh yeah I am like emotional. <laughs> yeah, not just... because I know people are going to be like they're worshiping right. It's not about that at all. It's just the um the joy that he emulates and the the passion and the vigor. It's convicting too cuz you're like Lord help me to have that, you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I'm... he's such a huge like I mean I like your title of the show that you want to Yeah. I mean, actually they're going to know. A gentle the, giant the gen of the faith. Yeah, because uh, he's such a capable guy in so many ways i mean he's a guy i really have been looking up to reading his books listening to hell's best kept secret at least 30 times yeah. i listened to it right or more and true and false conversion the evidence and, bible yeah way of the master i think i went through way of the master i don't know 15 times yeah or we've like got that. kids books the way of the master we've yeah. got i mean i was just looking at my bookshelf we've got so much uh world religions in a nutshell all of the tracks from living water so if you uh want to get tracks living waters is the place to go they're yeah. the gold standard for evangelism tracks yeah yeah and so like you're saying i mean there's like sycophants to where you just kind of like idolize somebody yeah. but then there's you know a biblical honoring of somebody and say hey you know the scriptures say give honor to him whose honors do right you know, even though i butchered that yeah and we're just trying to honor and you want to point the church you want to point the sheep the sheep to a good leader right, right? so they can learn from him and that's really the purpose of the show is just to point you to uh, living waters and knowing that he's just a faithful brother, humble brother, God has given him an incredible capability of mm -hmm. just mental like um, aptitude, like yeah. just a, just intellectual capabilities, but also just what really inspires me the most is like his longevity. Mm -hmm. That he goes out twice daily, and yeah. then that's just it's remarkable and and on fire and passionate about it when he speaks about it. It's not just this robotic. Yeah, I go and I do this. Almost like it's like a checklist, it, and it just goes so much up against like what the American, you know, American dream of is just, hey, when you get old and you retire, go and relax. Yeah. But he finds joy in seeking the lost. Right. Exactly. And that's it. He finds it. joy in it. Yeah. You well, know, and that's. What do you say? It's like diving into a big birthday cake. Yeah. With a mouthful of frosting. Right. That's the way you want to look at it. And I think that's why he's got such an uplifted spirit about him and just the capability to get up and be faithful every day because it, it is a joy. Yeah. Whereas some people think, well, just not doing anything is a joy. And that ends up just being misery. Yeah. And that's a road to destruction, too, because your body is not meant not to do anything. Right. And so, like we say, retirees and people with, you know, they don't have to work can have so much of an impact in the kingdom of God mm -hmm. if they would just find joy in doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's going to be cool when we get on the other side of eternity and then like God can, will show us like, this is what yeah, the I magnitude did with of it. this ministry. Because we have no idea. When you think about the mustard seed and it just expanding and, you know, this one person plants a seed and this person and it's all to God's glory and all his doing. He gets all the credit, but it's just this ministry has been incredible just to witness, uh, yeah. just to witness how they've made evangelism for the every man. I mean, exactly. we kind of just model our show just a little bit off of that, you know, oh, yeah, like they inspire us. We're just a smaller version of it. But, yeah, I mean, uh, just the utilization of the law. I mean, that's what Hell's Bet's kept secret is, mm -hmm. is the law and its function, its essential component in the gospel presentation, which brings a sinner the, the awareness of a sin, right? right. If the law is a tutor leading you to know that you need a savior because you're helpless before a holy God, it goes to show you that you're not good in light of God's standards, which is his own yeah. law, which is his holiness like right. like um ray was saying so uh thanks for watching our show it's a little bit shorter one we yeah. uh hope it was a blessing it was a tremendous blessing to us and we want to direct you to living waters you can find their youtube channel mm -hmm. subscribe like that learn from them go to livingwaters.com pick up hell's best kept secret and way of the master it's just invaluable to you and your training to be an evangelist um get it into your church get it into the life of your kids 
It's so important. So please do that. Yeah, and tracks. You can get tra- I already yeah, said tracks. That. tracks. Uh, I they have a, a podcast now too. Mm-hmm. So you can go to Living Waters Podcast. Um, if you haven't watched 180 yet, I mean, probably most of our listeners have, but it is 30 minutes. That is very much worth your time. It changed my life. Yeah, so life changing. 180 movie. You can watch the whole thing for free on YouTube. Yeah, um, it's, it's a good way to explain. Just you know, Ray and not only him, Easy and yeah. everybody else over there, Mark and Roman, uh, Eddie Roman. It's just life changing yeah. ministry, like life changing content because it's purely biblical and it's balanced too. Right. Um, it's not only the truth, but it's demonstrated in grace and love. And I think that's chiefly why God has put that ministry on a platform, continues to bless it, and is using it in such a massive way. So right. atheist delusions, another really yeah, there's really a lot. Great one. Yeah, there's just a just a plethora of just amazing material on there. So wow, cool. that was awesome. All right, well, thanks for tuning in. We got Luke the Bear going to be on next time. Yay! Yeah, he's going to come on in. It'll be fun <laughs> with that big old guy that I love so much. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, like, if you like this, subscribe um, and um, go out there. Like um, Ray just said, just preach the gospel. That's what we got to do. It's yeah. not so much in the messenger, it's in the message. And as you do it more, God blesses you. You find joy in it. And of course, um, through the message, it's the power of the salvation that God is using to save people. So yeah. get out there, share your faith, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. God bless.